Want to achieve network marketing success? Then you're in the right company. Hello, and welcome to Leave Nothing to Chance, hosted by networking marketing giant, John Solider. Learn everything you need to know about the network marketing space from somebody who's actually done it. Join us every week for front row seats as we feature some of the finest and most successful personalities in network marketing. Leave nothing to chance. Join us now. Wow, what a treat this is going to be, folks. You're going to love Mr. Ben Ward. And Ben, we've been trying to do this for a little bit of time. We're finally together. Hey, it's so good to be here. It's interesting. Some, some things that, that happen in life, you know, there's some detours that happen and you just keep pushing and make it happen. So thanks for, thanks for having me. Well, Ben, it's my pleasure. And, you know, Ben's been the best-selling author uh, of a book called Sellership. He's got a new book that we're eventually going to talk about because we're going to do two interviews, okay? Ben has been, been uh, somebody who's been helping people to achieve in the sales world for a number of years. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's a speaker. He's a coach. He's a dad. He's a ping-pong player. And you can get your ping-pong paddle behind you there. So, we're not exaggerating. There's the ping pong. I got my pickleball. This is my pickleball. Yeah, one. I, I was going to say that looks like a pickleball one. Yeah, I guess those sports are kind of transferable, I would think, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I fell in love with pickleball uh, with my ping pong background. I've played since I've been in diapers. And uh, now I live in San Clemente and, and a bunch of us come out and play pickleball these days. Well, it's amazing how pickleball has, has just become a huge sport. I had never heard of it. I, I, I turned 61 last week. And um, hey, happy birthday last uh, week. Thank, awesome. thank, thank you. Thank you. So, anyway, when I turned 50, I went to uh, the Huntsman Games. John Hutz, Huntsman and his family over in uh, Utah do the Huntsman Games every year for senior athletes. And the first year I was eligible, I was 50, and I went to throw the shot put. And there was a bunch of these old guys registering for something called pickleball. And I was like, what in the world? They got to be kidding, right? Like pickleball. What do you do? I throw pickles at each other. And man, I watched some of these guys in their 70s and 80s get it on in the pickleball court. And I was, I was like, wow, I've become a fan of pickleball ever since. They're inspiring, man. Some of those 70, 80 year olds out there just, just cranking it. It's amazing. It, it is. It really is. So, so Ben, let, let's talk about a few of the, the, the great concepts that you talk about because uh, they're they're not only inspiring, uh, they're inspiring for leadership, but you know they'll help people in in my industry of direct selling to grow their organizations, grow their customer bases, grow their distributor bases, etc. So let's uh, let's hit on a few of them. Let's talk about emptying the coins. Yeah, you know Benjamin Franklin. He said something that really that, that pierced me about 15 years ago as far as investing in yourself. And he, he said, empty the coins of your purse into your brain and your brain will fill your purse. And, you know, when I heard that, I'm just like, man, I have to apply that in my life. And, and so it, it was that day that I started, I started realizing that I need to invest. I need to, I need to invest in myself. And I need to work harder on my, Jim Rohn said this, uh, he said, I need to work harder on, you need to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And I thought at that time, I was just like, I need to spend, I need to spend not only time, but I need to spend some of the money that I earn in investing in learning from other people who've been there. And so I, I just love that little couplet from, from Benjamin Franklin. It's been powerful. You know, I didn't realize quite the level of statesmanship that he had, because I knew him as a historic figure here until I was over in Paris a few years ago. And I didn't realize that his, his role in European affairs, as well as American affairs, and how the Europeans look at him as far as you know, his role in the world, which uh, I never realized. But I was in a restaurant, and it was ironic because it's where the French Revolution was planned, and uh, I think it was Robespierre was the uh, the French politician who kind of led the French Revolution. And if I have that wrong to all my French people, including my French wife, I apologize. My history, <laughs> my history sometimes I get people. I'm 61, Ben. You know, sometimes I get people mixed up. But but <laughs> but uh, it was the restaurant where Robespierre had signed in blood uh, the oath of the French Revolution. And anyway, Franklin, you know. 
that whole genre and everything else, but it used to be his favorite restaurant in Paris. And I, I had forgotten, you know, his role as, as a statesman representing our country, obviously, uh, in, uh, in France way back. But uh, to your point, man, that's a brilliant point, right? Take, take the money and reinvest it and keep growing yourself, right? Your most important product that, that you have. And I think, I mean, those who are listening to this right now, you are investing in yourself. Like you have choices like crazy on what to spend your time and energy on. The fact that you're here listening to John, you've, you've, you've learned, maybe this is your first time listening to John, or maybe you've listened to a bunch of his podcasts, but as you continue to empty the, the, the coins of your purse into your brain, your brain will fill your purse. So I salute you for, for tuning in right now. And I could challenge you to continue to invest in yourself every single day. And Time is money, right? So the time that you're putting in, even though you're not, char- John's not charging you to, to watch this, as you continue to learn from incredible minds, you'll continue to grow in incredible ways. So Ben, let's talk about another one of the concepts that you talk about a lot. Four, number four, PLB. And folks, I hope you're taking notes at home. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned Jim Rohn a couple of minutes ago, you know, Jim was the master of having people having a diary uh, or a daytime or whatever you want to call it these days. And maybe it's your phone, but please take notes. The stuff that Ben is sharing is magical. It's life-changing. It's inspiring. And it's going to help you to grow as a person and to help grow your sales, your income, your team. Ben, tell us about 4PLB. Yeah, I got it right. PLB. <laughs> yeah, 4PLB. So I've learned, as, so I've led sales teams for 20 years and I've learned that there's there's four essential skills that every sales leader needs to master. So if you if you lead anybody in your life of any kind, um, but especially if you're if you're in direct sales or in, in any sales role, there's there's really four major keys that you want to dive deep into. You want to get really good at first the first you know the first pillar and four PLB stands for four pillar leadership blueprint and um, the first pillar is just culture. You know, as, as you as you build your team, what is the culture? Now, culture is something that is it really just the way you do things around here. You know, the, the way things are done, the way that things are things operate, and just kind of what it's like to be part of your team. And it's it's the environment. How do you create that? And the first pillar is all about getting the environment right. And if you get the environment right where you know you have people seeing each other as human beings as people rather than ordering being ordered by the boss as you know as an object you know the culture is is the first pillar and i go deep into into culture training and i help um, sales organizations um, and sales leaders create a very intentional purpose purpose purpose-driven culture Uh, because culture is going to form it's going to it's just going to it's going to happen or you can shape it and design it on purpose. And so that's like the first pillar is, is all about getting the culture and environment right. The second pillar, the, the, the key, second key that I've found in building and leading teams is an element of high productivity. You know, especially in a busy world, there's so many distractions. How do you get ultra clear, ultra focused and um, in, in, included in productivity is energy management. How do you manage the energy that you have, you know, in a given day as a leader taking, you know, a lot of, a lot of us leaders are responsible to sell personally ourselves to lead by example, and then also teach coach, mentor, train others around us, you know, to, to also to sell and to, to do, to be highly productive in, in our, in our day-to-day is an absolute key as a leader. If, if you miss this one pillar and and you, you you know if you just go straight for you know one of one of, you know one of the other pillars which i'm going to share in a second and you miss this one key one you're missing them it's like it's like a three-legged stool missing one of the, the third legs that that uh anyway so high productivity and there's strategies that, that i talk about one of them is actually a book that, that we're going to be doing another podcast episode on here in just a bit but one of the high productivity hacks is you got to pluck the FUD. And so we'll, we'll talk about that later, but I just want inter- to just introduce that thought. And, and the, the, the easy part in achieving success is learning the skills. So that's, that's the easy part, but the hard part is really learning to guard your mind 
and take action despite fear. And so there's a whole bunch of strategies we'll talk about in our next episode, but high productivity, how do you become highly productive in a very busy world? That's the second pillar and getting good there. There's a bunch of things that we can talk about. We will talk about and that, that you have on the top of your head as you're listening to this, like, what do you do to be highly productive? You know, what does your schedule look like? What do you, you know, um, anyway, so that the second pillar, first pillar is culture. Second pillar is high productivity. Third pillar is sales and selling, you know, the selling in a way that honors people. And, and we can talk about that for a long time. The, the fourth pillar is, is recruiting and retaining. It's, it's building the right team the right way. So those I found, you know, if we zoom in as a leader, leading a, a sales team, those four areas, culture, productivity, sales, recruiting and retention, those four areas are just the absolute key to driving high, you know, high results in, uh, in, in sales and leadership. You know, I, I love the fact that you've got the word blueprint in there, too, because, you know, when, when, when we think about it, wherever you are right now, folks, right, whether you're in your automobile, I know a lot of people listen to these podcasts in their cars. I know a lot of them listen to them on, on the treadmill at the gym. Uh, that's where I listen to most of my podcasts. I know a lot of other people do too. Or whether it's, it's you know, you're walking around the block maybe, or you're, 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 you know, you're probably in your home. Maybe you're in your office. Wherever you are, either the automobile you're driving, the bicycle you're on, the treadmill you're on, the building that you're in, every one of them started with some sort of a blueprint. So Ben, let's look at your thoughts on that. How, how do they blueprint their lives and their careers to manifest the type of success that we want for them? You know, it's so it's a reality. If we want to get to where we're where we want to go, we have to get very clear on on our intended destination. You know, and it's uh, it's critical for us to create you know a blueprint. One of the biggest blueprints that I've found is you know I got sucked into the trap of how do I succeed and what do I need to do for a long time and as soon as I learned this little master strategy that's that's like its own blueprint in itself is who rather than what do I need to do and how do I you know improve my sales I learned from a mentor who is already getting the results that that I want to get as a leader and and identifying who not how. It's easy to get sucked into like, oh, I got to like figure out how to do it. What do I need to do? And then drum up all the things. And, and that list goes on forever. But, uh, but identifying who's already doing it. Like, how can I find the person that's already achieving the results I want? And then success leaves clues, you know, modeling, being able to model after what highly successful people that are already getting the results that I'm getting and hitch my trailer to that person, that has become a mini microcosm blueprint on itself. Just that one, that one tip. And then you blueprint what's working for them, identifying how do, how do you make it happen? Just like a house. If you want to build a certain house, you go and you, you, you draw it up and you, you get the, the blueprints and there's, you know, it's ingredients that if you duplicate, you know, you can duplicate and achieve similar results as other people. And so I, I love that idea of, of modeling and success leaves clues and who, not how, who's doing it, not how. And there's a great book by Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan. It's called Who, Not How. And it goes actually deeper into that, that idea as well. Wow. Wow. You know, one of the things I loved hearing you talk about, I was watching one of your videos. It's the seven steps to leverage success. And, you know, we talk about leverage and network marketing all the time, right? We're in a leverage business and we are, and most businesses, you know, commercial real estate's a leverage business, insurance <laughs> in some degrees a leverage business, but let's talk about in terms of direct selling people, right? Talk about those seven steps and, and what they are and how they can apply them. Yeah, you know, so I found, so Brian Tracy um, is, has been a dear friend and a mentor of mine for the last 15 years. And he's a legend. I mean, he, I've read all of his books. He's written like 80 best-selling books. About 15 years ago, we were in a mastermind that, that he came and we flew him in and we had this like celebrity guest speaker come in and there's a, a group of us, maybe like 20 of us. And we were all sit, leading sales teams. And we, he mentioned something that, that just it hit me like it was like a ton of bricks across the head. Could just like, it, it hit me so hard. 
when he said that being good at sales and being good at leading other people in sales are two totally different skill sets. And, and I'm just like, yeah, like at that time I've been, I've been personally a high performing salesperson that just, just transitioned into leadership. So I just, I just had my first team that I was starting to, to, to run. I just became a manager. And when he said that, I, I found that that was exactly what I was going through. Like I was good at sales, but I, I didn't know how, you know, how to duplicate myself and how to, like, how do I successfully lead others? And so I share that to say that during the next 15 years of my life, I, I went on a crusade to figure out what, what does it take for somebody to successfully transition from being good yourself at sales to, to then leading other people. And so I, you know, you asked about the seven steps, you know, of, 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 uh, of lead, of you, as you said, seven steps, the, the context of that is it's the seven essential keys to go from selling to leading. And I wrote this book, Brian, Brian wrote the foreword and we coined this word sellership. How do you transition successfully into leadership? To, to successfully transition into leadership, it starts with the foundation of one of my one of my favorite words, which is called Genshai. And Genshai, it's spelled G-E-N-S-H-A-I. And a mutual friend of ours, Dan McCormick, Dan's the one who introduced that to me. And his good friend Kevin Hall wrote a book called Aspire. And they, he he's the first that I'm aware of that brought to life this ancient Hindi word. Genshai. And in fact, I have this little Genshai coin right here. And this, what Genshai means on the back, you can't really see it, but I'll just tell you what it, what it says. It's, it says to never treat another person in a manner that would make them feel small. Yeah. And including yourself. And, and so Genshai is the foundation of sellership and this idea how do you transition from sales into leadership in a way that's in a powerful way where you can actually we can really make an impact because there's leaders and there's those who lead right and there's 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 people that have leadership by title but then there's there's leaders that actually lead and inspire and the first key to like the first master strategy to a high influence as a leader is this is a deep foundation of Genshai and, and really treating people big. Now, big, big does not mean soft. Big, treating somebody big doesn't mean pretending to, you know, believe in them or treating somebody big is starts with a foundation of how do you see them as a human being? Do you see them as a, as a person? with needs and fear and that experience joy, that experiences pain, that goes through real struggles and we see them straightforward, you know, or, or do we see the people we lead as an object? And really, John, I mean, we could talk about this all day long, but there's three kind of main objects that we do, that we objectify people as human beings. You know, we turn people into objects, either one, an obstacle, it's just in our way and we just move them out of our way. A vehicle where we're just using them to get what we want. We just kind of, they're just a vehicle or, you know, possibly the, the, the most you know, dishonoring object is the third where we do this to human beings, where we, where they're just irrelevant. Mm. So, you know, we, maybe they don't even matter. We don't even see them. They don't even matter to us. They're irrelevant. And so Genshai is the foundation. This is the first key to high influence, to really effectively inspire the very best out of the people that we lead. Starts of a foundation of Genshai, to never treat another person in a manner that would make them feel small. Powerful. And boy, that, that's just biblical. And, and, you know, I know it's biblical to you and I, somebody listening, perhaps that, that, that isn't, you know, a Christian faith or, or a Jewish faith, you know, that's a principle in every religion in the world is to treat everybody that way. It's kind of like that old thing, you know, when the camera's rolling, everybody's on. 
But the second the camera stops rolling, does the actor or the athlete or the politician or the famous person all of a sudden, you know, treat the waiter or the, the bus boy poorly or do they treat them with as much respect as they would if the camera was rolling, you know, and that, that's a, I love that principle. Dan, Dan has mentioned that to me and you just, you just hammered it. So Genj, Genj, what's the, uh, what's the origin of that word? Is that, is that uh, Sanskrit or what is the uh, origin of it? Yeah, it's ancient Hindi. Hindi, Hindi. Okay. Okay. Yep. Great word. Great. I love words. <laughs> I'm a word yeah. junkie. I write these, <laughs> I write the, I think I told you this last time. I write these things down. I got, I got, I got yellow, yellow uh, sticky notes all over my computer from stuff that people say. Genshai is now on there. So you, you, wow, made, the, that's awesome. you, man, you made, you made a wall of fame here at my, at my uh, computer. <laughs> yes. I, I would say, John, I, I, I don't know where, where you're headed with me next. And by the way, for those listening, we're just having a conversation. We don't have any of this, this, uh, we're not scripting this. I, I, you know, that the first key is, is, is kind of, you know, it, it's a foundational piece. The second I don't know. We, we, there's there's seven of them. We can go through all of them, but the second one is very tactical. That I think your your listeners could gain a lot right away. That they could actually sink their teeth into and apply immediately. Should we ju- should we jump into the second piece? Absolutely. So the second key. So you know, it all start. It flows from a foundation of Genshai, right? And and you know, if you if you find yourself not really you know, caring about the people you lead, that's a starting point. You're, you're probably not going to be able to gain the highest influence, you know, from, from those that, that are in, under your charge that you're, that you're serving if that piece is missing. But I'll tell you what, you have a strong foundation of Gen Shy where they know that you care and they know that you believe in them. The second key is, is critical. If you want to influence somebody that you lead, and I've, and I've learned this in the trenches leading tens of thousands of sales leaders, sales people and sales leaders over the years. And I've found that in order to influence somebody, you've got to meet them where they're at. So the second key is, is I call it the vital few. And this is the way to meet somebody where they're at. It's a, a simple mind, heart, feet assessment. The principle of this is to, to effectively influence somebody. Before I say, follow me, I find you. So before I go and say, hey, follow me, like the first key is I find you. And how do you find somebody that you lead? How do you meet them where they're at? And I found that the vital few, these three keys is absolutely magic to to really influence somebody. And it starts with, it's a very simple model. Where's their mind at? what's going on in their mind. And and you can find out where their mind's at with very, very simple questions. That is not rocket science. Simple questions like, Hey, John, how are you showing up today, brother? You know, just, and and then let John, you know, Hey, this is going on. And you, you find, you want to get an insight into where their mind is at and you want to look for cues. Are they showing up like a victim or are they showing up like a creator? Mm. And you know, a creator has, is like, Hey, you know, I've had kind of a rough go, but it's, we're fighting through it. And it's, you know, things are okay. Things are good. Maybe they're fighting, maybe they're battling cancer right now in their family. Maybe they're battling, maybe they're, they're sick with COVID and, 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 or, or whatever the case may be. Maybe they just had their worst sales, you know, year or week or month or, and you want to look for cues. Are they, are they a victim to circumstance or are they a creator coming at it from an empowering perspective. You just want to get some cues. Where's their mind at? That will help you to know how you can help navigate and lead. And so where's their mind at? Where's their heart? And what this is, what are their, what's their why? What are their dreams? You don't know enough about the person you lead if you don't know what makes them tick, what gets them up out of bed in the morning. That's an indication into their heart. Their heart is also their goals. Like what are they, what are they pushing for and why? What does it mean to them? So they achieve that goal. They achieve that dream. What does it bring into their life? What does it mean? And that's, that's an indication. We don't know enough about the person we lead. If we don't know what's going on in their heart, where's their mind at? Where's their heart? And here's the key, John, I love this. And as I teach sales leaders all over America, this is a game changer because maybe their feet are like Eeyore. Maybe they're really slow, like Winnie the Pooh on Eeyore, you know, Eeyore, 
Mm-hmm. Winnie the Pooh, they're slow and maybe not moving. Or they're like Fred Flintstone flying, yabba dabba do, and they're flying, but maybe in the wrong direction, mm. right? Or maybe they're flying in the right direction like a hamster wheel and they're, they're not getting traction. Here's the key to the, the vital few, the, th- the three-part model. What controls our feet? The feet are the results. The feet are what's, you know, what are they doing with their time? What, what are their numbers looking like? What are their results? And what's, it, what's extremely valuable as a leader is knowing your mind and your heart control your feet. So if your feet are not headed in the right direction, it's, there's always a heart problem and or a mind problem and oftentimes both connected. But if you get the mind right and the heart right, the feet will fly and start achieving the goals that we want. So let me ask you this. Yeah. Let's talk about something that's going to shock them. Eating the frog. <laughs> Just as yeah. you took a big gulp, you're thinking of that frog. Tell them about eating the frog. Because I, man, this is this is golden stuff. Go ahead. Well, yeah, many many of you may have, have read the just the timeless book by by Brian Tracy, um, "Eat That Frog," and he wrote this book. It's a it's a book about um, doing the. And actually, let me introduce it like this: Mark Twain. The premise of of "Eat That Frog." is Mark Twain, he said, if, if, I, if, if you know that you're gonna have to eat a frog in a day, you might as well eat it for breakfast. You might as well eat it first thing in the morning, get it done. And Mark Twain, he elaborates a little bit. He's like, listen, imagine if, if you know you're gonna have to eat a frog and you're like, and you have to eat it before you go to bed that night. And imagine you're like, yeah, you know, I don't really wanna eat it yet. I'll eat it for, you know, after I eat breakfast, I'll eat breakfast and then I'll just like cram it down my throat. And then you just wreck your breakfast in your morning. And then, and then at that point you're full and you're like, ah, I'll just eat it for lunch. And then now you just, the anticipation of having to eat that nasty frog, you know, and, and you keep pushing it and pushing it and come lunchtime is like, oh, I'll eat it for dinner. Now you just wrecked your whole day and you're going to have to eat that thing before you go to bed. And so the, the principle is get it done. The things that we don't want to do that we know we need to do that move the needle. These are the things that make the biggest difference in in our work, in our life. Those are the frogs that the the, the sooner we're like, I'm afraid, I don't want to do it. It's nasty. But boom, we get done what we have to get done. Then we've just created victory over the whole day and everything else we do will be easier, more confidence, because we ate the, we ate our frog. Man, wow. I love that. I love that. that is, <laughs> because we've all got them every day, right? Every day there's something, okay, including today, right before we spoke here, I spent the last hour doing something that I was uncomfortable in, but I knew it had to get done. It had to get done. It was a time thing for my business for last month that I had to get finished early this month. And it was a time thing. And I was like, oh, man, do I go work out first? Do I eat first? This is early this morning. Okay, you know what? Let me go get my workout done. Let me ease into the day. And then all of a sudden, it was like, oh, man, I got to do I'm interviewing Ben at one. I got some other things I got to do tonight, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, okay, let me get it done. And you know what's funny about it, Ben? And you're so right with this principle. What I thought was going to take me probably two hours, 45 minutes, got it done. It was not uncomfortable. It was necessary, right? And, and, and we have we all have things in our business, or more importantly, in our in our lives that we have to do, right? Nobody wants to go to the doctor and get a checkup annually, right? Nobody. Totally. But but do we need to do we need to eat that frog? Yeah, right. Do we do we need to to deal with, uh, you know, whatever it is, right? We all got them. So, man, I, I love that principle. Leads me to another principle. Okay. Yeah. What do you got? And, and, man, it, this is. Kick in the RAS. Now, RAS, folks, is spelled R-A-S. Ben, explain. You know what I found? So uh, oftentimes, I'm sure this is case, the case for, for those that are listening, that you're, lead, you're a leader, right? You, you're leading things. You're, you're out there. You're selling. You're building teams. You're entrepreneurs. And what I found is, you know, people will ask, ask what's, hey, what's your, your biggest advice 
And I'm sure you get asked this question, John, a bunch, and, and our listeners do too. You know, if I, one of the biggest piece of advice in life to succeed, that I find myself answering that question, hey, what's, what's my number one advice? I would say you got to give yourself a kick in the rass. And, you know, what this, what this means is, you know, we all have, um, a, I'm going to get a little bit scientific with you. We all have in the back of our brain, uh, the reticular activating system. And it's, it's right back here in the back. It's actually about the size, I just grabbed this pencil. It's about the size of, a, of an eraser and, you know, and or maybe the, 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 the pinky nail of your, of your pinky finger. And it's back here. And what it is, it's the filter of your focus. It's, it's what filters what, what we focus on. And in fact, like right now, so I'm, I'm, in my, I'm in my home office here and there's like a million things that are just right here that I could sit and focus on. And then I can look at John right now and like how awesome, leave nothing to chance. And I wanna ask him about that. And I'm seeing the banners up there and you got the yellow, nothing is bold. And, and, and like, we could go on and on and on and on. Like for you that's watching, maybe, maybe you're driving and you're not really watching, you're listening. You know, maybe you're running on the treadmill. There's, there's an infinite amount of, of distractions and things around us, you know, all the way down to like, think about your stomach. Are you hungry right now? You know, like, oh, maybe you're thirsty. Maybe, maybe you have a stomach ache, you know, maybe you have to go to the bathroom, you know, on and on and on forever of the things that we could sit and fixate on and focus on. Our reticular activating system saves us because it, it's what filters our focus. And so here's the, here's the principle. The reticular activating system is what laser focuses on what's important to us. It's almost like it's an antenna that that's why written goals are so important because we write them down and all of a sudden our reticular activating system filters our focus and, and sends signals to help us get what we want. And when we know what we want, where our eyes will start to see things that will help us get what we want. Our mouth will start saying things to help us get what we want. Our arms will start reaching towards things that will help us get what we want. Our legs and our feet will start moving towards things that will help us get what we want. The key is you got to give yourself a kick in the RAS, in the RAS, the filter of your focus. What do you want more of in your life? Give yourself a kick. Get very clear on what you want, what you're pursuing, so that this signal of our brain can do its magic. The subconscious mind can start attracting the things that we want. And too many of us are fuzzy. And when, when we're not clear on what we're pursuing, all of a sudden we're like Alice in Wonderland. When Alice goes and she's wandering and the Cheshire cat comes up and he's like, she's like, Cheshire, where do I, how do I get to where I'm going? And Cheshire says something so wise. It says, that depends a great deal on where you want to go. And Allison said, or Alice said, I don't know where I want to go. And the Cheshire cat said, then it doesn't matter which road you take. And my friend, a super power to you is getting very clear on your intended destination. Give yourself not only give yourself a kick in the booty to get to work, but give yourself a kick in the RAS, spelling out what is what is what exactly is my intended destination? Because until we have that clarity on what we want, man, it almost doesn't matter what road we take and we'll find ourselves drifting like a river. The path of least resistance is what makes rivers and mankind crooked. And so you don't want to take the path of least resistance. You want to take a very intentional path. Give yourself a kick in the reticular activating system. <laughs> I, I've never heard it put quite that way before, but it makes so much sense. So let's, let's do this, Ben, okay? A couple of quick questions, and we'll close session one, okay? What's it like working with Brian Trace? I mean, you guys have a, a, a real working relationship. You mentioned it earlier and all of that. I mean, Brian's been around. Boy, I can't remember Brian not being around. I've been around 39 years and he's always, he was around long before I was and, and uh, crossed paths with him a few times. Certainly heard him speak at a number of occasions, own a bunch of his books. 
old tapes. I still own tapes, believe it or not. That's how long he's been around and I've been around, I guess. What's it like working with him though? I mean, he's, he's really been a mentor to you, I believe. Yeah. You know, he's, he's so gracious and he loves to give back. And uh, one thing that he that he says, um, one of the latest, most recent things that he, that he is telling everybody he can, the future belongs to those who ask and the future belongs to those who ask. And so what I found was well, over the years, as I've reached out to him asking, it's, it's amazing. I feel so surreal because I, I have his cell phone. We text each other from time to time and, and the future belongs to those who ask. What I found is I started reaching out and, and asking him like, Brian, this is probably crazy, but would you mind, you know, giving me a, giving like a, a testimonial on this? And he's like, Ben, the future belongs to those who ask. Like, yeah, you betcha. And I'd be delighted. And all the way down to just, you know, last two years ago when, when with my, with my book and like, I, I asked him, like, Brian, you know, you've inspired me so much with, with this idea of successfully transitioning from sales into leadership and, and, and you've helped me to go on a pursuit on how do you, how do you do that? And how do I help other sales leaders duplicate themselves? I would love to have your, your stamp on my new book. And he's like, Ben, you betcha. I'd be delighted. And then the undertone of the future belongs to those who ask. So I want to challenge you as you're listening to this, who are your mentors? Who's inspired you? Who have you learned from? And who makes, who's helped you to become great? Reach out to them. Let them know how much they've meant to you. And, and don't be afraid to ask for something that's going to serve other people around you. They will serve you as well, including them in that. And my advice to you is what Brian is, has shared. The future belongs to those who ask. And he, he's just a humble, incredible human being. You know, what's amazing is I've, I've never met Brian, but I've, I've met a number of other other people that at that level. Bob Proctor, I spent a week with on a, on a cruise a number of years ago. Same thing. Just, you know, you saw him in the hallway and you were like, you know, Mr. Proctor. He's like, Mr. Proctor was my dad. My name's Bob, you know, and, and I got a question, you know, there are 10 minutes. And I remember when I was a kid, my early 20s, I went to see Tom Hopkins in New Jersey. I was still living up there at the time. And, and he was coming out of the bathroom and he, he was about to start his seminar about 20 minutes later. And. And uh, I, I stopped him and, and he said, what's your biggest problem? And uh, I said, my biggest problem, I said, is uh, I'm afraid to talk to people. He said, OK, reached in his hip po his, uh, pocket and breast pocket, pulled out his business card, wrote on the back of it, do what you fear most and handed that to me. Boy, and I'll tell you, Ben, I probably had a thing in my wallet for 30 years. I don't know what happened to it. But when I finally got what I thought was successful enough. I actually wrote to him and then he wrote me back, same thing. But point being, the bigger, more successful people in the world, they're successful because they help a lot of people and they're really good people, you know? So that, that, that extra, let me ask you one last question for, for this round, okay? And then we'll tell can, people. Can I, can I interject sure. something before you do? Absolutely. You know, you've, you've touched on this a couple of times and I just think there's so much wisdom in what you just shared. In fact, I don't know how this, is, how this works. Oh, you know what? I want to show you my desktop. Uh, there's a pic, there's a certain picture on my desktop. Can you enable share on this so the oh, listeners can see? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Give me a second. I, now you're going to find out how how a six a 61 year old guy deals with technology. <laughs> I love it. Which means I normally yeah. yell for my wife. Jose. <laughs> for those that are listening, let this anticipation be be gold for you as we're doing this because what I'm about to share you has been so impactful that I've I've put this as my desktop screensaver and i guarantee this principle will be will be powerful for you so it should be good should be good boom okay all right john so here's can can you see what do you see here john i see a couple of pictures and virtual training books etc and do you see the do you see a little buffalo with a storm going on here yeah i do actually do you see that on that so that's my screensaver and and uh what this what this represents, this is a buffalo that now buffalo are known to charge straight into the storm. And so what Tom Hopkins invited with you, do the thing you fear. Like, so this right here, this picture inspires me and motivates me to, to be like a buffalo. And the things that I fear, what is it that I'm afraid of? 
and charge straight into it. Now, what I think is really fascinating is that somehow I, we don't know the reason why Buffalo intuitively charge into the storm, but, but over the years I've thought about this and I, I think the reason why is because they know intuitively that the fastest route to calm weather is on the backside of the storm. And so they just charge straight into it. And because of that, they experience the calm much faster than if they tried to chase, to, to move away from the storm and the, the storm chases them and, and it takes hours and hours and days and days and they keep moving from the storm, but instead going straight through it, the calmest weather is on the backside of that storm. And so I challenge you to be like a buffalo and like what John just taught us from Tom Hopkins, you know, what is it that you fear? Eat the frog, charge straight into what it is that you fear. And that's a major recipe for success. Man, man I, I love it. And I, I went up to South Dakota two years ago, like at that height of COVID, I was driving my wife and my kids crazy because I was, at, you know, like yourself, I've traveled all the time for years. I don't sort of I'm home every day. And my wife said, can you go on vacation? Yeah, sure. Where do you want to go? No, no. Can you go on vacation? She sent me on vacation and I had never been there. And I drove up to South Dakota and I spent a week looking at Buffalo and you're absolutely right. The most fascinating animal I've ever seen, but they do that. They, I, I never thought of it that way. They go, they run into the storm instead of running away from the storm, confront the storm because you're going to have to confront it eventually. I think is that they're wise enough to know sometimes they're smarter than we are probably, you know? So, so Ben, let me, let me, let me touch on one other thing. Okay. And then we'll get to, to how we're going to do the second show and we'll share that with everybody. Hold your book up again. How do they get it? Yeah. So it's, you can get it on, on Amazon, Audible, iTunes, and it's just straight on to, to, to Amazon. You can get on any of those three ways right there. You can download, you can listen to it. In fact, Brian Tracy reads the foreword and, and I personally read the book. It's a, it's a parable. It's, a, it's an easy to read story about a salesperson who's transitioned into leadership and they experience all the common challenges. And uh, yeah, so it's an easy, it, it would only take a couple hours to listen to it. You can listen to it at 1.5 speed and be done in like in two and a half hours, or you can just pick it up and listen and uh, read it in, in an afternoon. Because, you know, the, the question I have to ask you is this, going back in my own career, right? Everybody thinks I've been in network marketing my whole life, and I actually haven't. I had a little segue in the early 80s where the company I was with had some trouble with the FDA. And I stepped out and I went in the insurance business. I worked for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. And I'll never forget my boss, a guy named Nick Donato, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years back. And Nick was a, a great guy and another mentor of mine. Nick had been a great agent, very successful. And, you know, in the insurance business, as you know, because you train insurance people and, and others, you know, you make minimum 55% on a contract. So a $1,000 premium made 550 bucks. But you go out with an agent as a manager, you make about 2% of that, right? So you go out for the night, you spend, you know, three hours sitting in somebody's living room and you made about 20 bucks. And the agent that writes the policy, sometimes who's new in the business, makes five, 600 bucks or more. And I'll never forget driving home with, with him from one of those appointments. And he said, I got to get out of management and get back to personal production. And, uh, you know, I remember that and it's, it's, you know, now 30 plus years ago and all of that. How do you help people deal with that? Because a good producer, be it in network marketing, like I do now, I have done most of my career, whether it's in insurance or whether it's in real estate or anything that has a management role. How do you help that somebody to cross that? And I know sellership does, but give me, give me, give me one little tease them to, to buy the book. Folks, we want you to buy the book. Okay. But tease, <laughs> tease them one thing, because I know some of my distributors listening to this and some of the distributors are not in my downline, but they're in Dan's downline to listen to it. And my friend Joe and some of the other guys I work with in the industry that are colleagues, I know their downlines listen to the show as well. And they all wrestle with that sometimes. Do I spend more time recruiting or do I spend more time helping my downline recruit? Help us cross that bridge. Yeah. You know, sales is the short game and building a team and recruiting is, is, a, is the long game. And there's definitely a struggle between, I, I work with sales leaders uh, all over and there's, all, there's definitely a struggle of like, I could just make more money going and selling personally myself, you know? And, 
And rather than dealing with all of the, the challenges and the, who, the, some of the babysitting that might have to, to happen and, you know, and, and as you're going through. And so, you know, this, this book, let me just share. So chapter eight, there's a formula for effective coaching and teaching. It's a four-part formula that I've learned is absolute magic. And it's part of every single, every time I uh, personal mentoring with sales leaders, this, be, this becomes a, a, a linchpin, a critical piece on how to successfully lead other people. Now, here's the reality. It takes all day to rescue. It's going to take you all day to rescue your people, you know, and, and to, you know, to, to resolve concerns, to go through and to convince, convince them, you know, to, it takes all day to rescue. It takes five minutes to challenge, but there's a formula. There's a shortcut on how do you pierce through to gain traction as a leader to help drive your people into action. And there's a four parts, four part formula we talk about here in, in chapter eight, four part coaching, coaching model. And then, you know, chapter nine, four laws of leadership. These laws are magic for gaining, helping to inspire the very best out of the people that you lead. And, you know, my, my publisher was like, you know what? You, you don't need to put so much rich, dense content in here. Maybe let's take some of the content out. And I'm just like, no way. I want to be like, well, they're not going to need you. You know, if they get the book, they're not going to need you. I'm like, good. Because, because leaders create, leaders don't create followers. Leaders create more leaders. And so my goal here is to actually help you to transition successfully into leadership and uh, share a ton of key principles to help you do that right here. Okay, folks, so let me tell you what's gonna happen here. So you're listening to this show on July 5th, right? We're after the 4th of July here in the United States, Canada Day, great way to start off. Really, hey Ben, it's the second half of the year is what this show is really helping people to start, right? We all have goals for the second half of 2022 already. It's remarkable that we're already there, but we're gonna come back on July 12th and we're gonna tell you how to pluck the FUD and I got to be careful how I say that. Okay? <laughs> but, but that's, careful there. <laughs> that's, that's Ben's upcoming book. And he's going to tell you in that interview what Pluck the Fud means and what it means more importantly for you. So, Ben, you'll come back and do that show with me? Absolutely. Look forward to it. All right. Great. Well, thank you, my friend. Thank you, brother. It's been awesome. Great. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Leave Nothing to Chance. If you want to know more about what it takes to succeed in the network marketing space, join us again next week for another amazing episode. For additional resources and to connect with John Solider, visit leavingnothingtochance.com. Don't forget to leave a review, and we'll see you next time.